So 2021 has been like a pretty interesting year. In some ways, it feels like we're still living in 2020, but you know, in some ways, things are obviously a lot better. We had the vaccines bringing us hope at the beginning of the year, and then you know, a slow kind of rollout in the Delta variant felt like a big setback and kind of delayed us getting into the new normal. Um, now, you know, the past few months have been dominated by these discussions around inflation, supply chain bottlenecks and labor shortages. And it's becoming clear that mass and virtual events aren't the only things that have kind of changed in the post COVID world. On labor shortages in particular, much, much of the conversation has been focused on the impacts on the retail and hospitality sectors. But the impacts of the tight labor market have extended into every industry, including tech. I'm sure many of you who are probably like me, extremely online types, um, have been seeing a lot more of those, some personal news tweets uh, as people announce their, you know, kind of goings and, and new beginnings um, in the in this kind of crazy job market that we're in. And, you know, it's just just another example of how the challenge of recruiting and retaining talent in tech has never been harder. I, and just listening to the kind of discussion that was happening um, right before the Orbit video, people are talking about, you know, how expensive things are and uh, the difficulty in finding senior level uh, developer relations folks. And um, I think that applies across many different job types. Technology companies have been super resilient during the pandemic. Uh, driven both by their ability to kind of adjust to the changes in the world, like working from home, um, but also the growing importance of technology in everyday life as more of our lives moved online. I mean, we've all been attending virtual conferences for a few years now, like millions of kids did online school for an extended period of time. Um, lots of us were ordering groceries on, you know, different delivery services, you know, so I think Technology has really become even more prevalent in, in people's lives as a result of all of this change that's been happening. And, you know, the kind of success of technology companies coupled with this need for every company to become a software company um, has created more demand than ever for this limited pool of people with these similar technical skill sets. And so there's literally more opportunities than ever before for technical people to go out and find work. And if you couple that, with inflation driving wages higher, the end result is that more people are changing jobs. The shift is so prevalent that it's even got a name, the Great Resignation. I'm not sure if anyone you know else is uh, you know a, a fan of kind of the news like I am, but um, you'll find count countless articles online uh, about this phenomenon that's happening across every industry, including tech. And so. You know, I'll start by kind of talking about what managers, leaders, and organizations can do, um, but there's going to be lots of lessons for individuals in here as well. Before I go on, I want to introduce myself. I'm John Coglin. Uh, I've been involved in developer evangelism for more than five years. I've been in a leadership role at GitLab for just over a year, and I managed our developer evangelism team. The team consists of developer evangelists and program managers, and collectively, we engage with the GitLab community through content creation, community engagement, and community programs like our GitLab Heroes program, which recognizes our most active community members. Um, as we go through the talk, you know, GitLab, our mission is that everyone can contribute. And so I'd love for people to give feedback, ask questions. You know, you can Google some of the stuff that I'm talking about. It's, it's all publicly available in the GitLab handbook. Um, and if you find any, you know, typos or things that you want to change in the handbook, you can even, you know, open up a merge request and submit your changes and, and just tag me um, at John Coglin, one word in a uh, comment on the merge request, and I'll be happy to check it out. And um, you can start contributing to the GitLab, you know, job families that we'll be talking about today and, and some of the process around building those. So to get started, I'm gonna just kind of rely on a sports analogy and I apologize, but I'm a big college sports fan. And in recent years, there's been changes in the collegiate rule book that have really empowered players. And then here's a picture of my alma mater, Penn State. Um, so one of the big changes for players is the creation of this thing called a transfer portal. And student athletes can enter this portal 
and they're allowed to talk to coaches from other schools and learn about the opportunities that exist outside their own campus. Another big change for student athletes has been the creation of a one-time transfer exception. So previously students, when they switch schools would have to sit out a full year of their kind of, you know, playing eligibility before they could play their sport again. With this exception, student athletes who switch schools can take the field or court for their new teams once they're enrolled. And these changes have created more transparency, flexibility, and choice than ever before for players. The result is that coaches now need to worry not just about recruiting new players for their teams, but they also need to focus on recruiting their own players. So in the past, coaches would have been you know, primarily focused on star players and bringing in new recruits. Um, but now they need to make sure that everyone on the team is getting attention and happy in order to kind of continue to build their programs and their culture. And this means, you know, more work for those coaches, but it's clearly a net positive for the players. And all of this is very, you know, reminiscent about what we're seeing play out in tech. You know, there's more flexibility, more transparency and more opportunity. And people are, or, you know, kind of team members are finding that, you know, they can go out and really explore this job market and find great new opportunities elsewhere. And it's really kind of shifting where the leverage is. Um, and so this brings us back to that question I was asking earlier, like what can managers, leaders, and organizations do right now? So we need to be recruiting our own players in addition to building up our teams and pipelines. So recruiting is more competitive than ever. Our team members have all of this opportunity in front of them. And the importance of both recruiting, but also retaining our teams has never been higher. So we can ensure that we have happy, high-performing teams. If we constantly have churn and people coming and going, we're never going to reach that kind of, you know, high-performing level um, that you need to get to after you go through your kind of norming, storming um, levels. And so, you know, when I think about building high-performing teams, I always go back to a lesson I learned when I was reading Daniel Pink's book, Drive. I don't know why, I can't remember why I read this book because it's really a book about management. And I probably read it like five or six years ago, way before I became a manager. But regardless, the lessons from that book have really stuck with me. I probably read it because I didn't like my manager at the time. I was like, maybe I can give this person some pointers from the book. Um, but yeah, in that book, the author outlines three aspects of work that drive high performance and their autonomy, mastery, and purpose. And so, you know, based on some research that the author did, there's evidence that by providing each of these kind of motivators to your teams, you can drive higher performance than any extrinsic motivators like higher pay or bigger titles or kind of more responsibility. And so, you know, I often think about how can I provide this for my team? Like, how can I give them these elements of autonomy, mastery, and purpose? And there are a lot of different kind of ways to approach that, but clearly this talk is about the DevRel career ladder. So um, we're going to focus on that because I think there's a lot in having a clear career ladder for your team um, that you can unlock to kind of drive each of these different elements. So for people that haven't been, you know, kind of listening to the other talks today, because I know there's been a lot of great talks, um, you know, on this topic, a career letter shows the progression for a specific role through a number of different levels and provides a map for people to follow to achieve higher levels of responsibility and mastery in their chosen career path. And it does this by providing clarity around each role and each level within that role. And so a well-defined career ladder will include an overview, detailed responsibilities and requirements for each level, performance indicators or expected results for each level, and it will show you how to progress out of your kind of job family or, or the career path that you're on into higher level roles um, or even horizontal moves as well. So the best career path take all these elements and provide options for people looking at both kind of people management and individual contributor paths. Um, and so you need to be able to kind of have those, those dual paths uh, for people who have different kind of passions and different personalities. Um, and you also, you know, show these lateral moves that you can make for people who are maybe interested in, in exploring different career paths. And I know, um, 
in some of the talks that I've seen throughout the day, a lot of people talk about, you know, movement from DevRel into product management or product, you know, technical roles into DevRel. Um, and so, you know, having those explicitly written out in your kind of career ladder, um, you know, gives people a clear sense of where, where they can logically move in your organization. And it gives people, a, giving that kind of clear definition then allows people to, you know, have more autonomy over the decisions that they make around the work that they're doing and who they're spending time with and, and, and can help them um, have more success, success in it, achieving those goals. There's a number of reasons, a number of other reasons that career ladders are so important. Um, the transparency shows people what's required to grow in an organization. And so for people who are, you know, motivated high performers and who want to advance in their career, it's essential that you give them this roadmap for success. Um, by providing clarity of like these requirements and kind of responsibilities at each level, uh, people know what they can kind of aspire to. They know what type of work they need to focus on. The performance indicators really allow people um, to, you know, have a metric that they can measure their success by. And so for, you know, people who are data-driven, results-oriented people, they want to know, okay, am I, you know, am I doing a good job or not? And if you don't have performance indicators, it, it can be really difficult. And, you know, I know a lot of talks also touched on this topic of burnout. Um, and without having a clear sense of like, these are the deliverables for my role, these are the results that I'm supposed to deliver, it can, you know, be hard to say no to things. And that's, you know, one of the reasons people often wind up feeling really burnt out. And, you know, like this last piece is the, you know, the key, right, which is, you know, it gives people ownership of their careers so they can clearly understand the requirements, they know the expect expectations and what they need to achieve to progress. And this empowers them. They can, you know, align their development with their career goals. And it also allows them to advocate for themselves when they feel like they're ready to take the next step in their career. And I think like some of the best career development conversations I've had with my team are when people bring, you know, the results that they're delivering, the wins that they've had and say, look, I want you to see all this great stuff that I've done. And this is why, you know, I think I'm ready for the next level. And, um, you know, oftentimes, you know, those kind of conversations lead to, you know, people getting the results that they want, which is, you know, promotion and more opportunity. Um, so now we understand like kind of this fundamentals of um, what makes a career ladder, you know, what makes a good career ladder. Let's, let's dive into the elements, like the, the kind of details. So every good career ladder is gonna start with an overview of the role. And so I often joke that if you put a bunch of DevRel people in a room, Sorry. the conversation yeah. inevitably lands on one of three topics. Hey, John, I don't think your slide advanced. Uh, okay. Yeah, I, the slides are kind of like loosely associated with the talk, but. Um, okay, but you have a cityscape, that's the slide you want? Yeah, okay. uh, yeah, that's fine. Um, yeah, so I often joke that if you put a bunch of DevRel people in a room that the conversation is going to land on one of three topics. What metrics should we measure? Which org are we supposed to report into? And what should our job title be? And so for the last one at GitLab, we used developer evangelist, but that was just like through process of elimination because we already had advocates and, and people with relations in their titles. Um, but everything that we're going to talk about today apply, applies to, to these roles broadly. Um, and every good career ladder is going to start with like an overview of this developer advocate or developer evangelist role. Um, the overview sets the stage and it can add a lot of like nuance and kind of, um, you know, be a place to like give some flavor, some context, maybe like a little bit of storytelling about the role, the team's mission and, and those types of things. Um, so make sure you take that opportunity to speak about your organization's mission, how your team fits in. Um, maybe if your team has a specific mission, mention it there. Talk about the structure of the team, you know, where they report into, um, you know, and I think all of this kind of touches on that purpose element. And so when you have in your kind of overview, like this is the organization's, kind of, you know, or company's mission, and this is how we contribute to that. People can see like, does this align with the sense of purpose that I have for my career? Um, and then they'll also, you know, may, be able to make that decision around where they fit 
um, you know, like on the team. And so, you know, this, the overview, you know, it seems kind of simplistic, but I think it's really, you know, an important element and sets a tone for the rest of this, you know, kind of career ladder that can, and the rest can be, you know, somewhat more um, or somewhat less kind of creative and more, um, you know, detailed and specific. And so I think, you know, take advantage of the, of the overview to give yourself, um, you know, the, to provide that color about your team and where they fit into the broader organization. The next step is to kind of have, you know, your levels and any specialties that you may want to include. So for GitLab, our developer evangelist job family, we have multiple levels. So it starts with your developer evangelist, then senior, then staff, then manager, and then we also have a program manager role. Um, you know, doing some research for this, you know, there's definitely organizations out there that have principal DevRel roles. I didn't find any organizations that have like higher level, like DevRel fellows or something to that effect. Um, but would love to hear about it if if anybody you know, is aware or is one of those kind of levels themselves. Um, but yeah, the the teams that tend to have like that principal level role um, seem to be parts of like really big organizations. And so depending on your team's maturity, that's probably something you, you know, if you're a very mature, large organization, that's probably something to consider. Um, you know, you may also want to have junior or associate developer um, relations roles. So you need to kind of think about what the needs are for your organization and who you're looking to, you know, bring in, and then you can assign those levels accordingly. And then, you know, once you have the levels laid out, you also need to think about what type of specialties that you need. So at GitLab, we're hiring for a community engagement specialty. And this is because we're a super community focused company. A ton of our kind of announcements and communications, you know, our, our team is being asked to give input on, you know, all of our kind of announcements, communications, blog posts. And so just given the volume of kind of things that we're being pulled into, um, because we have such a good understanding and empathy for our community members, um, we needed to bring someone in to really focus on that stuff. Uh, and that way, the other developer evangelists on our team can focus on more of the traditional kind of DevRel activities like conference talks and blog posts and workshops and those types of things. Um, but yeah, the specialties for your organization should align with kind of the work that your team will be doing. So, um, you know, maybe that's aligning with specific products that your organization offers. Um, I've seen, uh, you know, a lot of companies do stuff around integrations. There could be specific audiences that you want to target. Um, and then there's also companies that segment their DevRel functions by region, um, which is another really cool option to consider. It's not something that we've done at GitLab yet, but I could see that being something that we, you know, explore in the future. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, the kind of general rule of thumb is that the larger your organization and the broader your product surface area, the more specialization that your team will have. So if you're a smaller org or a startup, you probably won't need to worry about that. But if your organization's growing, um, you know, that may be something that you need to look at. So yeah, now once you've laid out these levels and specialties, the next step is to create a set of responsibilities for each. So the responsibilities clearly define the expectations for the role. And so in DevRel, this could, you know, arguably be like more important than any other job in tech. And, you know, as I touched on earlier, um, the reason is that, you know, the breadth of things that people are asking DevRel teams to do um, and the unique kind of skill set that DevRel people have means that we can do a lot of things, but that can often be really overwhelming. So like, just imagine you're kind of Monday, like you're writing a blog, working on a tech talk, communicating like with your meetup community about an upcoming event and maybe answering some stack questions on Stack Overflow and like, and that's just Monday. Um, but, you know, that can get super overwhelming when you think about that over like a five day week and then over a month and over a year, like, and that's why I think, you know, burnout becomes such a popular topic in this industry. But if you have this, you know, clearly defined set of responsibilities, then that makes it much easier for people to say no. And so, 
you know, there was a talk in 2018 that James Governor did at this event, and it was entitled Sympathy for the DevRel. It's one of the best talk titles I've heard, and all the slides were like Rolling Stone song. Such a great talk. Um, but in that talk, like, it, there was a, a slide highlighting the importance of people in DevRel to say no, which is so real and so important. But without that framework, you know, where you can go back to your, you know, kind of, you know, responsibilities and say, actually, this is not my job. Um, it can be really hard to say no. And especially people in DevRel tend to be these outgoing kind of people pleaser um, type of people that love to help others. And when you combine that with a unclear set of responsibilities, you can wind up in a really weird place. Um, and so making sure that you have that clarity about your role is so important and gives you that kind of confidence that you need to say no and not feel, you know, like not be losing sleep over it. Um, so yeah, to just, to, you know, to kind of wrap that up, you know, and that's like the autonomy element, um, that I mentioned earlier, like when people know what the expectations are, they can take control of their backlog, their calendar and their career. And it makes them feel a lot more empowered and gives them a lot more flexibility to kind of decide what the right things to be working on are. So requirements are like the next piece in the career ladder puzzle. Um, you can think of responsibilities as like the stuff that team members will own, but the requirements are the skills that you need to achieve those things. And so depending on the responsibilities that you outline for your team, requirements could be things like technical proficiency, communication skills, values alignment, experience levels, you know, maybe you need people with a certain kind of reach or, or following on, online um, or, you know, experiencing community, community leadership roles. Um, and so, you know, kind of whatever those requirements are, you know, just keep in mind that, you know, while I, I think requirements can sometimes, you know, exclude good people from good positions, but, you know, it's also important for people to be set up for success. And so you want to make sure that, um, you know, you're clear about these requirements and that way, you know, a person who's taking on the work at a certain level has the skill sets and the experience that they need to be successful. Um, so yeah, when you're defining these requirements, just keep in mind what's necessary for a person to succeed at each level and then align those requirements accordingly. So, I'm, you know, and a lot of orgs, more senior team members are going to be expected to help support the junior team members. So mentorship and leadership skills might become um, important as a person kind of climbs up their ladder. Um, the ability to connect, you know, either with a broader audience or higher level, you know, more technical audiences um, or both may also be required as people advance in their careers. More senior people may also need, you know, greater kind of domain knowledge or really you know, specific languages that they're familiar with or, or um, you know, content creation skills that maybe a, a more junior person doesn't uh, possess. So once you have those responsibilities, you know, and requirements tied up, um, you know, you can understand it and make sure that they're both aligned. And I think the requirements kind of fits with this mastery element. And so when you provide people with this clear set of requirements that they need to advance, they're empowered to align their professional development with their career goals to reach that next level. And so, um, you know, you'll find that people, you know, who are, um, you know, ambitious and driven, they'll see what they need to do to get to that next level and they'll work to develop those skills accordingly. And so, yeah, the next thing, um, for your career letter jobs, family, and, you know, potentially for even um, each level and specialty, depending on how you structure your team is the performance indicators or expected results. And, you know, when you think about how this is different from responsibilities, think of your responsibilities as what you will do and your performance indicators is, are how you measure what you will do. So I made that joke earlier about the three topics you'll inevitably hear if you put a bunch of DevRel folks together. Um, and of course, now I'm bringing up, you know, metrics, but, um, I'm actually not going to get too far down into it. Um, there's so many great resources out there to touch on metrics for DevRel. Um, I have a blog post out of, on it uh, on my 
personal blog, but there's also going to be a ton of great talks um, throughout the rest of the event that cover metrics. And so if you're looking to evaluate what type of metrics to add to your career ladder, I would encourage you to like consume some of that content, um, join the talks, listen, ask questions, engage in the Discord, uh, and use what you learn to inform and improve the performance indicators that you're using for your team. And then you document those in your career ladder and you're all set. So we've discussed these critical elements of the career ladder, an overview, levels, specialties, responsibilities, requirements, and performance indicators. The next step is to put them into a cohesive and comprehensive order. And this is the latter part. Um, so finally, the slides are starting to make sense. Um, but yeah, when you start at the lowest level, each rung on the ladder should have another rung above it. And it may also make sense for there to be a, a rung to the side when horizontal moves are real and attractive options for a person. So, um, you know, some natural moves might be into product marketing or product management. Um, and this grid should be publicly available to everyone in the organization so that folks in product marketing and product management who want to move into DevRel also know that there's opportunities there for them. Um, and that's something that we do really well at GitLab. If you look for our marketing career ladder, you can go to like GitLab marketing career ladder and go take a look and see what all of the different kind of movements um, and potential opportunities exist for our team. So yeah, just a couple other things to highlight before we kind of move on. Um, when you're crafting your career ladders, make sure you use inclusive language. Um, that's so important to make sure that everyone feels like they can see themselves in, in all of these different um, roles and levels. And yeah, for junior levels, I think, you know, we talked about experience as a potential requirement. I would discourage, you know, strict experience um, requirements for junior levels because I think it'll open up more opportunity for people from diverse and unique backgrounds to apply. Um, you know, and particularly for DevRel roles, like I'm from a non-traditional background. I know PJ from our team um, who presented earlier, you know, also comes from a non-traditional background. I think there's a lot of great people in DevRel who, if you look at their CVs, you'd be surprised about where they started and how they got here. Um, and so, I, you know, definitely want to make sure that we keep that kind of um, uniqueness and, and, and interesting kind of community that's that's building here um, by, you know, not having too much strict experience requirements and, and allowing people to get a start. Um, and, you know, this can help you attract a broader pool of candidates. Um, but it, it's also just, I think the right thing to do. So, um, big plus one, you know, to that for me. So we have the different levels, the different elements to consider for each level. Um, the levels are structured into an organized progression and with lateral moves. And now like, what do we do with this? So I think like, this is like the important part and this is the call to action for all of you. Um, so, you know, it's time like to get to work. And so whether you have a career ladder in place or you're looking to start something new, the next best step is like, go talk about this with your team. Um, start a dialogue, get everyone contributing. And, you know, this shouldn't be something that falls strictly on like the team leadership or the manager of a team. Um, everyone on the team should be able to contribute to this and have their input and kind of goals and aspirations and vision for the team accounted for in the career ladder. Um, just like the team's results are have shared kind of ownership um, and career development is something that's shared between managers and and the people that report to them, like the career ladder, you know, I think is just the same exact thing. It's something that the team and the, and the leadership need to collaborate on. Um, and that makes sure that, you know, the ladders are aligned with day-to-day -day realities of the role, uh, the future needs of the organization and the team members, and, and it sets everyone up for success. And so, you know, these documents, like go out, get started, collaborate with your team on them, um, and then be empowered to use these in your kind of discussions around career development that you're having with your manager or with the people on your team. Um, you know, discuss them, make changes, make them dynamic documents, update them as the company changes and the roles grow, um, and make sure that, you know, that they're viable and valuable to the team and, and the business. 